yes now we, we sort of um, ran out of road uh, at, uh, at one o'clock so do you want to just take a step back and situate us in um, in, in, in this mission it was all, it was all about um, Abba wasn't it? Uh, my lord yes I, I was going to navigate us so I, I'm in part three of my submissions which is my, my headline submission <coughs> and I was dealing with Raman um, but I moved to Aladesalu to answer questions from my lady uh, and I made three points about Aladesalu. I was, I was about to come to the third. So the, the three points... Will you just give us the three altogether? Uh, yeah. Indeed, yes. So the, the first crucial point about Aladesalu is that the applicants in that case did meet the requirement of being dependent on an EU citizen at the time that they moved because their, their, their sponsor had always been an EU citizen. Yes. The second was just to draw the court's attention to, a, to, to the fact that the reasoning in Aladesalu on application is addressing a very specific submission from the Secretary of State in that case. And I, I had to read the passage a couple of times. It, it's paragraph 38. So <coughs> the Secretary of State was arguing in this case that they couldn't qualify. <coughs> shall, we have, no, uh, shall we have 38 in front of us? Yes, so. it's tab, it's tab 8, Aladesalu. Right, page 163. <coughs> page 163. So the, the issue in Aladesalu was, can somebody qualify if they arrive before their sponsor? The factual matrix being that there they had Nigerian nationals who had always been dependent on their Dutch sponsor. <coughs> the issue was that they arrived first. And what the Secretary of State sought to do, and it's captured at par paragraph 38, is extract from the reasoning of Rahman a requirement that there be a, a, a nexus between the, the two arrivals. So about halfway down the paragraph, it, it says it is submitted that the applicant... So this is recording the Secretary of State's quite specific submission that the court was addressing... It's, it's submitted that the applicant can't fulfil the requirement as to dependence in the country from which they came at the time of the application. And the reason that's in italics is because that was the Secretary of State's submission. Since they came to the UK between 12 and 21 months before the EU citizen on whom they are dependent. So what it, was all, it was all construing accompanying or joining. Yes, it was all yeah. about accompanying or joining. So when, when the court is talking about the, the timing of the application in Aladesu, it, it's referring back to the Secretary of State's submission, <coughs> which is effectively extracting from the reasoning in Rahman a, a restriction in effect on the circumstances in which a person could qualify. Mm. So that's, and the third point that I was coming to on Aladesalu is this, that paragraph 48 of Aladesalu effectively supports the Secretary of State's position because there what's being discussed is, well, well could this have a deterrent effect? <coughs> of course, in a situation where there had always been a well, deterrent effect. Shall we read 48, is it? Uh, it's, it's 49. 49. Yes, yeah, sorry, 49. Yes. So remember, of course, that here they had been dependent on an EU citizen before coming to the host state, but the Secretary of State was effectively inviting the court to read in a, an additional restriction into the rule which said and you need to have arrived at, at roughly the same time. So what the court is then doing is saying, I don't expect the Secretary of State's submission, made in support of the submission I've just captured, that the exercise of free movement rights is incapable of being adversely affected. But what the court does then, importantly, is focus on an example which very much requires there to be a live right which is in contemplation at the time that the third country national... This is the UT's made. example. The UT's example. Yes, the UT's example, exactly. Because there, um, at, at the point that the third country nationals move, there is an EU citizen with a present right. Mm. And that's the difference between that case and this one. So 
So that I hope answers. I, I don't need to come back to Aladesily now. Those are my submissions on Aladesily, which <coughs> takes me back to Raman then. Uh, and Raman is at tab 12. <coughs> So I'd, I'd taken the court to paragraphs 31 to 35, which are sidelined and which I say are key, just to remind the court, my, my central submission, that what these paragraphs are doing is describing the principle behind Article 3.2 rather than simply applying them to the facts of the case. I just invite the court to turn back to the Advocate General's opinion at paragraph 99. And before I, I'll invite the court to read it, but before the court reads it, could I just set the scene? What the Advocate General here is dealing with is why the criterion doesn't relate to the time at which the EU citizen moves, but rather at the time, he, he describes it as the application for entry and residence, but, it, but one can see from the context that he's talking about the point at which the third country national moves. So this, this gives a couple of scenarios. If the dependency existed at the time of settlement in the host member state, meaning the EU citizen settlement, but has been interrupted since then, the condition laid down by Article 3.2 will not be satisfied because there won't have been dependency at the time that the third country national moves. Um, if, on the other hand, the situation of dependency arises after the EU citizen enters the host member state, the family member may regard it as being dependent this could be the case, for example, for a union citizen who, after exercising his right of free movement, is required to care for a nephew. So again, it's all focused on what happens at the point the third country national moves, which is why I submit <coughs> that's the bit that matters rather than what happens when the EU citizen moves. So to wrap up on Raman, effectively, we submit that it's obvious why the requirement relates to the point at which the third country national moves, because at that point there needs to be a meaningful connection with EU law, and I won't repeat the submissions I've already made on that. Just to finish on Rahman for completeness, and to tie up a, a strand from... A, question that I answered earlier from my Lord, Lord Justice Singh about, well, why can't the person just go back? Um, it's just, I mentioned Raman question five. So just for the court's note, question five is all about paragraph 36. Could I just ask the court to read 36? This is about the dependency that's referred to in Article 3.2, so at the point the person moves or before the person moves, rather than Question 6 dependency, which is the domestic law dependency. And essentially, the answer to Question 5 says, yes, member states, and it's captured at paragraph 40, member states can impose 
particular requirements relating to the nature and duration of dependence, provided that those are consistent <coughs> with the normal meaning of the words relating <coughs> to the dependence referred to in Article 32A. And the dependence referred to in Article 32A is dependence on the country of origin. And somewhere in the Advocate General's opinion, when he's looking at this question, he says, well, the member state can't say you've got to have been dependent for 20 years before moving, for example. But this, in relation to the question of well, what if somebody just went back and tried to artificially create the condition, the member state might say, well, be <coughs> dependence in substance. And question five makes clear that the member states can impose some requirements on dependence in Article 3. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that really addresses the scenario that I was contemplating. I mean, just take the facts of this case. Uh, as I understand it, there's no dispute, or at least no relevant dispute, that this uh, applicant has at all material times been dependent on the sponsor, whether in Bangladesh or in the UK. So if one simply t changed the geography and moved her back for some time, maybe it, maybe a few weeks, maybe longer, it doesn't really matter. But all, all I'm contemplating is that uh, the only thing that she seems to have got wrong, and you may say it's critical, is the place from where she made the application. Well, that, my submission that, that that's not what she got wrong. What, what, what she got wrong was moving and seeking to rely on a right which required her to be dependent on a union citizen at the point. You say she jumped the gun. Yes. But yes, what, what, if, what, if, what if she'd waited? What if she'd waited the, the three years that it took, for example, her sponsor to come to, or the four years, I think. I think it was found that he started exercising treaty rights in February 2014. What if she'd waited, for example, until he came? Or until she could say, well, he's got free movement rights now. An Aladesi type analogy, he's got free movement rights now. He's thinking about exercising them. It's right that I, I come first. But, but she didn't. And, and the fact that she didn't rather illustrates how far this case is from the EU law condition that, that the directive applies. Because she came independently. She came to study. Her sponsor arrived several years later. Now, I, I wouldn't one can't speculate on the fact that there, there will be a question of fact if she can't do it because EU law no longer applies but had, had this case been three years ago say there would be a question as to whether if somebody goes back and says right I've stayed in Bangladesh for a day now I've satisfied the requirement the answer might be well look at Rahman Rahman says what you need to show is close and stable family ties with a union citizen because the, the difficulty is that she doesn't meet the central requirements. Now, it, it, I can't speculate on what the answer would be on the facts, but, but I come back to the, the three points I made fundamentally in response, which is that the condition needs to be satisfied, and, and any applicant could, in my submission, say, well, I could have organised things differently, and then I would have complied in any in any immigration situation. Or yes, you know, that, that's your fundamental that's point. Fundamental but all, point. All, all I was suggesting is I'm not sure the answer to question five, which is really, I think, more about people manipulating through a device. That, that may be something different, I think. Yes, I, I, think, I think my point, was, it was simply, yes, and sorry for the confusion, it, it, was, it was an add-on point, um, really, in, in response to the, the third limb of my answer yes. to that question, which is to say, and... and the, the member state can do that, but I accept. Yes, it, it's it's a small point, a headline point, is as as uh, your lordship just said. So that that's were, were you drawing back from what I understood you to be saying before it, that um, on the face of it, there'd be no reason why she couldn't apply from Bangladesh, um, couldn't have applied from Bangladesh in no, pre-existing circumstances, mm -hmm. and um, um, but that would not, if it was a genuine dependency which had, as it were, failed only because the sequencing had been got wrong. Uh, that, that There would be nothing on the face of it objectionable. No, had she... I, I make a point in my skeleton where, where the point is argued on the facts, well, she's been dependent for, been dependent for five weeks on a union citizen before she leaves, Qu query if that would satisfy the condition. Right. But there has to be... There has to be... Uh, and I'm reading from... I'm reading from Rahman. There has to, the person has to show close and stable family ties with a union citizen in their state of origin. So the, the factual question in any case would be, is that requirement satisfied? 
she wouldn't, I mean, your submission doesn't lead to the idea that she's in a catch-22 situation and she can't move either backwards or forwards in order to achieve this status. Well, um, it, it's quite possible that she could have, she, could have achieved it. She could have, I mean, she, she, could, she could have done <coughs> yes, she didn't, but she could have done because yeah. she came to the UK in, I think it, it's 2010. Um, she studied for three years. As of 2014, she had no more leave. She made an application in 2015. Here we are in 2021. She has had no form of leave since then. Yes, at any point it would have been open to her to say, right, okay, I haven't, I haven't complied with the law. Um, I'm going to think about how I can comply with the law. And provided, I think, I think my point is twofold. One, that the person has to meet the condition of substance. So it, it, that that's a factual point. Is there? close and stable family ties with a union citizen, and two, um, that if there is, there isn't a problem with a person doing things so as to meet the conditions of the right, but what they can't do, and, and as my Lord Lord Justice Singh rightly says, my headline point is what they can't do is say, well, I could have done that, so treat me as having satisfied the condition, because that, that would effectively mean that the, the condition doesn't bite, mm. and there's a reason that the condition bites, even though as... Um, your lordship observed at the very beginning this may be hard facts but we're not we're not dealing with hard we're dealing with a point of principle yes right. is that raman that's raman um could i just take the court to obo for completeness because i've referenced it in my skeleton argument tab seven So the facts of Obo at paragraphs four to eight, the reason I, I accept that this case is not directly on point, I accept there is no case directly on point, the reason that I take the court to it is because I say it, it really is just the mirror image of this case. So in Obo, the applicants had a relationship with a person who was an EU citizen at the point that they left. But their problem was that the first year tribunal rejected their evidence that they were dependent before they left, and so they only had post um, post arrival dependency. But they had the relationship with an EU citizen. So, in effect, and because uh, because Lord Justice Beetson can say things far better than I ever could, I rely on the reasoning in this case as analogous to the facts that arise here. So just just for the court's note, the, the appellant in this case relied very heavily on an argument that all that was relevant was the position Sorry, as, on uh, relied on an argument that all that was relevant was the position as at the date of application. And that's we, paragraph, paragraph twenty eight. Thank you. I won't, I won't take the court's passages because they, they in effect mirror submissions I've been making in this case, but, but could I invite the court to note paragraphs 47 onwards, and I'm sorry that that isn't sidelined, where the court deals with Aladesalu. And then the, the court then, then discusses the arguments that are being made. And then at paragraph 50, the court says, at just below E, if the category is to be extended beyond that indicated by the plain meaning of the provision, this can be done only if a wider reading is both necessary in order to give effect to the purpose of the directive and permissible under established rules of interpretation. Then it says we are unable to identify any policy which would require, require such a reading. And then at paragraph 52, the court says, there 
is a temporal or geographical threshold. And that isn't out with the normal meaning of the word facilitate or the word related to dependence in Article 3 too. And then the court goes on. And again, I, I would invite the court to read the, all of this passage. The court goes on to posit different scenarios. And it says, well, yes, there might be issues on particular facts. But then the key passage I have sidelined over the page on 146 is that this is a rule of general application. You say all of that could be transposed into this case. Yes, and, and indeed what one could say, well, why couldn't these appellants could have just gone, they, they were dependent by the time they made their application, they could have just gone back to their country of origin uh, and been dependent there for a while and then that would have sorted things out. But that that's, that's not the point. The point is, well, there's a rule and, and it needs to be complied with. And then the, the court summarises the position at the top of 147 by saying the policy of advancing free movement might, the, might well be advanced if the criteria delimiting the category of other family members are set wider. However, that's not what the directive does. It uses clear words to set the limits of the qualifying category. And I say the same applies here. There's also a passage which helps you in paragraph 54. If you look at the policy. Yes. Yes, exactly. It's the, the last. It's the last part of that that paragraph. We have difficulty in seeing why a failure to accord preferential treatment to dependents resident in a third member state or a non-member state should constitute a disincentive to the EU national yes. to set up his residence in the host member state. Yes, I exactly, and that that that's part of the background as to why the court is not willing to do what it says needs to be done, which yeah. is identify a good reason for setting aside the clear words of the directive. Mm. And for the reasons I've submitted, I accept on different facts, but for similar reasons, I say the same logic applies here, and more fundamentally, because at the crucial point that the rule bites, more so than Oboe, there was no connection with EU law at all. At least mm. the appellants in Oboe had a relationship with an EU citizen at the time that they moved albeit that they weren't dependent. So that that's that and that that completes the third part of my submissions and I won't I won't take up the court's time by summarising it, but the summary of my <coughs> submissions on this point is at thirty and thirty one of my skeleton arguments. Just on that last submission, can I just be clear what you're saying? Suppose the facts were different and the sponsor uncle had acquired Italian nationality and moved to the UK to work. And then the applicant, who was dependent on him in, a, in Bangladesh, came to join him in the UK. O on your submission, w w would she be eligible yes. under the Yes, because... So the fact that... It, provided he's an Italian, <coughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but I mean, that, that, that just perhaps means that we need to exercise a little bit of caution about having regard to this underlying policy. Because in that situation, there's no nexus between her moving here and his having any incentive or disincentive to move around member states. But nevertheless, she clearly would qualify then. But yes, but I would submit that the crucial difference there is that the language of Article yes. 3 too is satisfied, yes. whereas in this scenario it isn't. Yeah. And, and yeah. the point that the court makes in OVO is, well, we've got the language, we're not going to set the language aside until unless we can identify a good reason. And I say the same applies here. The, the fact that the fact that when the rule bites, um, it, it's, it's sometimes a bit difficult to see why the rule did what it did is, is a different point in my submission. And, yes. and that is part of the reasoning in OBO. But nonetheless, the rule sets the condition where it sets it. it in, in my Lord's example, she satisfies it and there's no question. Yeah. Yeah. In the end, one, one, as often happens in appeals in this court, one comes back to the fundamental point. And, 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 and although I know it's not the only point, 
um, there is the point that it does use the word ah. Yes, precisely, and we say that language is clear and there's simply no good reason to displace it. If anything, the directive is clearer than the regulations mm. in that regard. Yes, and I, and I hadn't gone to the regulations because, of course, I say that, that they're certainly not, that they they need to be construed consistently with, with the directive. directive. And in fact, the directive gives you the steer as to how you construe the regulations. Yes, exactly. And it, it's not a case where it can be said that the regulations are more generous. Uh, there are no. cases, in fact, there's, there's a case before this court next week uh, on a different point, a, a precisely that point, what what, what happens when domestic legislation seems to be more generous, that, and that's cases like energy solutions, yeah. and can it be construed, can it still be construed consistently? But here, that there isn't any reason to say that the regulations are more generous. They, they clearly have to be read hand in hand, because the language, the language goes hand in hand with the directive, albeit that the language of the directive is crisp and very clear. Um, the, the domestic regulations, of course, doing two things, which is a, imposing that additional domestic condition <coughs> on continued dependency. So it, it's slightly more complex than the domestic legislation. So that, that's my headline point. I said that I would have some mock-up points um, in response to the arguments that have been advanced, and there are three that have been advanced orally. One is the LaSalvia coffee. The second is the, well, it could all be dealt with at the discretion stage argument. And the third is about deterrence. I've dealt with the LaSalle Biakovsky point in some detail in the skeleton argument at 49 to 59. I, I don't want to take up a lot of time with it, but perhaps could I just make a couple of points on the authority? Because I, 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 I stand by what the skeleton argument said. There are two fundamental points on this in the Secretary of State submission. The first is that the argument that the appellant is advancing is, in effect, that once a person becomes an EU citizen, they must be treated as if they were an EU citizen all along. And that, in my submission, is ambitious, uh, unsupported by any authority, and clearly wrong in principle. And then the second headline point on the Sal and Ziakovsky is that the Ziakovsky line of case law is all about what happens when a new state exceeds the EU. Even then, that's not the consistent line of case law, and I've mentioned it, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, and one can see that in some other cases. But in any event, that doesn't really matter, because the point here is that this is not an accession case. It's, it's a case where there is a requirement in EU law, which is simple. It says there has to be dependency on an EU citizen at the point that you move. There's a reason for that rule, which is that's the only way to ensure that there's some connection with EU law at the point that the person moves. That's, that's completely different from what's being considered in the Sal and Zeal in, in that case, there's a sort of washback of EU law into the past. Um, that, that, that EU law becomes retrospective in, in, in its effect. But that, that's different from the changing of the status of the individuals within the yes. system. So um, it wouldn't have, have, have availed the uncle in this case if, um, um, if, uh, if, if it were Italy had exceeded um, it, it, it wouldn't have saved him from the consequences of him not having been an EU citizen at yes, that time. He no. wasn't an Italian citizen. And if one takes the argument to its logical conclusion, suppose, for example, that in the direct family member situation, a person, uh, Miss, Mrs. Y, marries Mr. X, and at that point, Mr. X is not an EU citizen, but the person concerned turns up and says, well, give me a right to reside, please because I'm the spouse of a person who's going to become an EU citizen and makes a claim for benefits, say, on the back of that, mm. the answer would be, well, no, you can't, because you're not an EU citizen. He's not an EU citizen right now. Is this under your point one here? Is, is, is this the, it, it, uh, as it were, untold effects? It's, 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 it's in effect answering um, your Lordship's question. It's why is this different? And what, so I, I've, I've strayed into some additional submissions, but 
the point is this, that it, it, the, if it's right that a person's treated in union citizen all along, then in my example just now, a person could claim benefits for a period when they had no right of EU residence at all. Mm. And that, that's simply wrong. Right from the point that you become an EU citizen on a personal level, but no no rule by which you are treated as an EU citizen for all purposes. It's really an illustration of my first headline argument. So I, I the appellant has relied on three cases, uh, a case called Duke, which is at tab 12, which is the court, again, I don't need to take the court to it, but the court's note. Could I just draw the court's attention to paragraph 24? which makes absolutely clear what Duke is about. It's a case about discriminatory treatment rather than the acquisition of rights acquired before provisions come into force. So that, that's Duke. It's got nothing to do with this in my submission. LaSalle is a case about a person who's always been French. And, and what LaSalle is about is, right, we've got a new, we've got a new right that's come into being. Um, when can you acquire that right? That, that's all the salad is about. It's about does it doesn't have any bearing on this. And then the final case is Yilkovsky, <coughs> which is at tab 13. That was about the meaning of um, uh, has resided for five years. It, it was, yes. And it, it was the, the point in Yilkovsky is the person concerned had always been a Polish national. There was no, it wasn't a, a third country national and then a Polish national. And it's all about, it's paragraph 56 and 7. It's all about what happens when a new state accedes to the EU, which is not this case. And also, the court says, ah, and, and even in that situation, if there are transitional provisions concerning the application of the new right, then those transitional provisions apply. Here, what we have is a rule which says you need to show dependence on a union citizen in the country of origin. It's completely different because what 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 my my learned friend's argument would do is just just make that condition not apply at all. Mm. Pretend uh, pretend somebody was an EU citizen when they were. So that that's my answer on the Salon Bielkowski. Just the court's note, my skeleton refers to a couple of authorities where even in a situation where a state did exceed to the EU, the person wasn't treated as an EU citizen. <coughs> so that's the court's note. The cases I cite at paragraph 51 of my skeleton are at tab 16 and tab 17. Did I say the principle's clear and I, I don't need to take the court to those? So that, that then leaves two points to deal with. The second was the argument that it can all be dealt with at the discretion stage. Short answer to that is, well, if that, if that was the way the directive worked, we wouldn't have a gateway condition. The directive could have said, any other family members need to be considered on their individual facts. I think, I, I think the, Ms. Knight was using it to say, you needn't worry about horrendous abuses, um, because they would be picked up at the discretion stage. Yes. Yeah. But they would or they could, but the point is that the legislature has set a gateway condition and it can't be right to say we'll, we'll ignore the wording of the rule because it could be sorted out in a different way. Mm. And then my final point on deterrence, two points on this, um, to answer a question from my Lord Lord Justice Singh in terms of can one look at hypotheticals uh, yes, although it's right to point out that it's not every deterrent which counts, and that's the case of Schindler, which the court has at tab 7, I'm sorry, tab 6, at paragraph 43. But my headline point is if one's looking at deterrents, one has to look at deterrents at the point that the rule bites, and there can't have been any deterrent effect on the exercise of rights because he wasn't an EU citizen. So th that wraps up my submissions. There are various other arguments that have been advanced, but not questorally, that are, that are dealt with in my skeleton argument. So the, the the argument about family life and the charter is dealt with in my skeleton. It's 
things they dealt with in chemistry. Um, so I, I rely on my skeleton argument. And then finally, I said that I thought there must be a case in the bundle which sets out that family member rights are not autonomous rights, they're parasitic. There isn't. I've word searched it, but that proposition is common ground. And if it would help the court, we can send an authority to that effect. I don't think we need that. I'm very grateful. Those are my submissions, unless I can help further. Uh, Thank I, you very I much. Say, I'm so sorry. I'm getting instructions by email. So if my clients uh, can hear and see me and I've said anything that needs to be corrected, I will invite them to email me. But I hope not to trouble the court again. I can't. Well, this is all very modern. <laughs> yes, I have, uh, I, uh, I have nobody sitting I mean, behind me. I mean, Mr. O'Kelly hasn't even got to the yellow post it note stage. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm not uh, expecting anything, but I, I just mentioned that just in case. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, yes, I have had the disadvantage of having WhatsApp messages from my juniors in remote hearing. It's very difficult. Um, just some brief points in reply, and then I'll come specifically to the Ziokowski point because I think that does require a little bit more uh, elaboration. Just in short reply, we don't concede there's a literal textual, and on a literal textual analysis, we necessarily lose. If the text is clear, you still need to adopt a purposive construction to allow for the situation that is not catered for, which is the one we contend for in terms of acquisition um, of citizenship. And to, just for the court to note, we say, Reference METOC as cited in La Salle at paragraph 31. That's the moment. Um. The second point, uh, just I make in relation to Article 3 2 and the we and R, it, 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 we still, there's still in my submission, in our submission, needs to be a read in. Because the, it, the, the wording of th Article 3.2 talks about persons who are, who are in the country from which they have come are dependents or members of the household of the European, of the citizen. So the, they would have to, um, part, when making the application, if they are, they have to, they, they wouldn't necessarily, they would have to have been a member of the household and are. Uh, and are making the application. It seems to me to that in my submission that the were and are applies to both the household condition as well as the dependent condition. Um, but in any event, our case is in re relates to dependency. Um, it's just in response to my Lord Lord Justice Singh's point, we say that the question of the European, the Union citizen in, 30, in Article 3.2 is the signifier and then the status is having the primary right of residence. So that's so we, we that's why we, talk, we we say that there's a distinction between the union citizen who's de describing the the person there, the, the family member of the Europe, of the union citizen, and then what they then need to have is the primary right of residence uh, 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 as a status. Um, here we are as at the time of the application, a household member in the UK, but not in Bangladesh, a past and current dependent. And on the facts, we say there's a the chilling effect, back to the point about deterrence, is if the appellant is refused now, because the sponsor who's in the UK exercising treaty rights has to consider going elsewhere if his family member is required to leave, that is to, in order to maintain the unity of his, fa of his family. That is a consideration to which the court can have regard. There isn't any authority for Ms. Smythe's proposition that the deterrent effect has to only be um, in the context of at the time of the, um, of the person moving. There's, there's a, we say there's a broader potential context in relation to deterrent effect. And uh, she didn't cite an authority for that in my submission. She just made that submission. Um, well, there's quite a body of um, case law about um, deterrent effect on treaty rights, and it's usually at the time when you're seeking to exercise them. Well, at the, at, at, as things currently stand, the, the sponsor has exercised treaty rights and is in the UK. Yeah, so you have to look to see whether it's going to have a, a deterrent effect on his exercising them in future. 
which it can't because if he goes to somewhere else within the EU, she could join him there. But the deterrent effect is the requiring him to go elsewhere in order to achieve family unity. That is a deterrent effect. So l l let's take a different case where, where, where uh, uh, let's, <coughs> if it doesn't completely skew the analysis, um, this was a, a, a child niece. Yes. Um, then in those circumstances, if the child niece had to go to Bangladesh to make the application, the sponsor uncle might feel it incumbent to have to accompany. That's certainly one scenario, indeed. And, that and, would so, be and you'd say that was... If there's an impact on his, what he's doing now, he's exercising treaty rights, and if the refusal... That would disturb his <coughs> wish to stay in, 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 in the uh, member state. If he wishes to remain in the member state, exercising treaty rights, and if, as in response to my lady, uh, Lady Justice Andrews' observation that, well, he can just go to another third country, so what? That is a deterrent effect from him exercising the treaty rights in the UK and carrying on his business that he's doing now. It is a live and real question. It can't just be dismissed to say, well, he could go elsewhere, because that is not the answer to this question, which is, he moved from Italy to the UK to exercise treaty rights. And if the only way he can maintain his family unity with his pre you're, you're making dependence. maintaining family unity the primary reason for the directive, which all of the case law says it isn't. It's a secondary reason, which is parasitic upon his exercise of his treaty rights. So you have to say, uh, is it going to deter him from setting up his establishment in the UK? No, because he's already done it. Is it going to deter him, if he wishes, from going elsewhere? No, it's not. Is it going to, not my lady, my response to that, if I may, is to say, is it going to deter him from maintaining his exercise of treaty rights in the UK? Answer, yes. That's the, it's, that's the, it's, my submission is as simple as that, because he can't maintain his treaty, exercise of treaty rights in the UK. Yes, he can. He can, he can. he can continue to stay here and work here, and her presence within the jurisdiction doesn't make any difference to that. He can maintain her while she's abroad. But this is this is, and that's exactly what one of the cases actually says. That was the, in the situation, I think, in in the um, in in Obo, I was yeah. Or, or, but the the situation here is different on the facts of in Obo. One, we have a pre-existing dependency. Two, we have a post. Uh, we have a, we are now dependent in the UK. And three, we are member of a household. So that is what would be disrupted, mm. and it is in in interpreting the the situation. Yeah. Wouldn't you need some findings of fact? Mm. Well, we we have those. We have we don't have findings as to what he would do. No. But, but it I mean, is. I'm, no, I'm asking you. Wouldn't yes. you need them, as it were, to to, to make good this submission? Because it doesn't, <coughs> on the face of it, it doesn't sound terribly likely that he would um, r remove himself or his entire family to Bangladesh simply because his niece had to go there um, and reapply. I mean, wh wh what we say is that this, considering my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Singh's question about hypothesis, in interpreting this provision, one has to look at what's the hypothetical consequence of refusing the... the, the right. So you, you say one can, one, one can find, contrary to the discussion before lunch, one can find um, situations in which a deterrent effect might be perceived. It might be yes. I, I I appreciate before lunch that I had suggested that at the time there wasn't couldn't conceive. No, I, I one understand this, but I think one has, uh, that one has emerged, and particularly because it's in response to Miss Smythe's point, which is that the deterrent effect can only be considered at the time of the application, whereas we say the deterrent effect can it must be the construction must be evaluated in the context of the application that is made, and so therefore it has a greater. Um, context in which that evaluation should sh should take place. Just coming back to OBO, we say, unlike OBO, we have a, both a past and present dependency and a household and continuing dependency. Um, so maintaining dep the financial dependency from abroad isn't now the, isn't the answer. Um, and the sole, the sole question in OBO was whether the dependency on the EU citizen or membership of the household arose only only after their arrival. So there was no Miss. So w of course, Miss Smythe and I were at odds because her focus is all about they had a relationship with an EU national. But we say this case is is 
actually and importantly distinct because there's a because there's a clear acceptance of a long-standing dependency on a person who becomes an EU national. And we say that the rights under the directive are there to protect dependents of persons who are or become EU nationals and not just forward-looking. So we are entirely at odds. And it does require the court to construe carefully what the impact of that of those two submissions are. But that's why, I guess, we, we're necessarily quite far apart. Um, and in OBA, there was no prior dependency as an EU national, either here in Italy or in Nigeria. So quite unsurprisingly, the court not only found that found against the applicants, but also that there was no uh, deterrent uh, effect and that they could, in fact, carry on any financial, current financial dependency from wherever they would happen to go. We're, we're very far, very far from that. Um, it is um, one of the overarching points, just in response, is that we say EU citizens who acquire national who acquire their nationality are being treated very differently by adopting the, sec the construction that the Secretary of State uh, contends for. And there needs to be a good reason for that. Uh, and when we come to just what the, I just wanted to take you back to Z Zielkowski, just for one, I took the court already to the paragraph 58, which talked about what was the effect of acquiring citizenship. But which was that the provisions of citizenship are applicable as soon as they enter into force and must be applied to the present effects of situations arriving previously. But at 60, they're looking at the, the Article 16 about acquiring permanent rights of residence. Consequently, the provisions of Article 16 can be relied by union citizens and be applied to the present and future effects of situations arising before the accession of the Republic of Poland to the EU. It is admittedly true that periods of residence completed in the territory of a host member state by the national of another state before the accession of the latter state to the EU fell not within the scope of EU law, but solely within the law of the host member state. So, Miss, I think it must have been a slip of the tongue by my learned friend, Miss Smythe, but she, re she referred to Mr. Zielkowski as not being a third country national when he was residing in Germany. He was. He was a third country national. He was a Polish national who had no connection with the EU whatsoever because he was Polish. And it wasn't part of the EU. And yet the court, once there had been an accession, gave uh, effective said we want to give a, apply the present effects to the situation arriving previously. So well, that's it, because he had lawfully resided in Poland for five years. Yeah. And so in interpreting the relevant directive, it was said, well, you don't have to start all over again and live in Poland for another five years before you can acquire that status. Um, the effect of accession is that um, when we're seeing whether you've lawfully abided in, in, in a, an EU country, we're treating it at the time of your application for your status. Um, and we're looking retroactively and saying, well, you were, in fact, lawfully in that country, which is now a member of the EU. But importantly, when the court was looking at the right, acquiring the right of permanent residence, it was look. It had to be in accordance with the directive. Mm. So the directive was therefore giving retrospective acknowledgement to those who had acquired in relation to residence to say you were right, residing in, in in Germany lawfully, but not in accordance with the directive because you. They, Polish nationals were not residing in Germany in accordance with any directive until accession. And then post-accession, we will say that permanent residence is given to those persons who were residing in Poland in order lawfully. And, on, and the reason that was, the way that was uh, explained was in order to, it must to be given present effect to the situation. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it says, does not give retroactive effect to Article 16. In other words, Article 16 of the relevant directive didn't operate retrospectively from the date of the acquisition of, uh, of the accession of Poland. Instead, the court interpreted the requirements of the directive as a matter of its language and its purpose of construction as meaning that um, the, the, citizen, the person who's now a citizen of the EU 
doesn't have to wait another five years before he gets permanent residence, but he can show uh, he can rely on his lawful residence in what is now an EU country prior to its accession. But it's entirely right to say, in my submission, that at the time Mr. Ziolkowski was residing in Germany, uh, when he was lawfully residing in Germany, that residence had nothing to do with being an EU national. On, 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 on Miss uh, Smythe's case, she would have to accept that. And if it has nothing to do with being an EU national, then what? how is that residence relevant once he becomes an EU national? And that's what we say in my lady's, my lady's construction is about the purpose of construction, which is that at 62, provided the person's concern can demonstrate that the, the, that the periods work in compliance with the conditions, so we say conditions here we equivalent to dependency rather than dependency in the country of origin, conditions laid down, if, if we we're applying it to the, to the appellant's current status, laid down in Article 7.1, and taking account of such periods from the date of accession of the member state concerned does not give retroactive effect, but gives present effect to situations which arose before the date of transposition of that directive. And that's the principle we rely on here. Um, it's not ambitious. It is right that there's no authority in it from any higher court, but applying those principles and applying the principle that dependency is what the, the directive protects and promotes and facilitates, and that in the context of persons who acquire nationality, the key factor is what was their status before they acquired the nationality, i.e. is there evidence of dependency? of their family members, we say yes there is. And in those circumstances, once you become a national, in applying it purposefully, that same principle as my lady observed in Ziolkowski, leads to a very strong support for the proposition and the construction that the appellants contend here, which is we were dependent, we became an EU national, and now you have to read that article three to another. Completely different situations, but the the effect of um, Ziolkowski is, to me at least, to be that um, with the accession of Poland um, and the becoming of all Polish nationals as EU citizens, uh, what this decision is saying is that. Um, the purpose of calculating the benefits that accrue to those now EU citizens, one doesn't ignore life before the accession date, yes. um, because there would be nothing that Polish citizens could do about that. Um, they could have been here forever, their dependents or themselves or whatever they're qualifying. Um, they, but they could have been there forever, but they could do nothing about it. Yes. And so therefore, as a policy approach, um, one treats, one takes into account prior events, even though they had no way of being EU citizens at the time they occurred. This is entirely different, um, because um, we're, we're dependent upon somebody who was applying to become an, an Italian citizen. As it turns out, he got his citizenship. Um, he might never have done so it's in different yes. circumstances, but he got his citizenship. But it, it's not looking at a circumstance where an entire nation is being faced with ha having to um, have their entire past ignored for, for legal purposes. Well, um, in my submission, it's not an entire nation. Sorry to interrupt, my lord. No. It's only those Polish nationals who were in a, in a an EU country. Well, that's a, that, 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 that I think was quite a lot of people. From this, Poland. I accept that. I do accept that. But in, but in my submission, because it affected a lot of a large cohort, so we say. It's not a reason. Yeah, but it was asking, it, it was in a sense removing the court having to perform the, uh, as a legal requirement, the task of, of uh, blindfolding itself to everything that had happened before accession day. Yeah. Um, whereas in this case, there's no particular problem with people just doing it according to the rules. Save for the fact that the rules and the regulation, the, uh, the, uh, the directive, as uh, my Lord was just listening, observed this morning, doesn't expressly provide for persons who require EU nationality. Uh, no, that's the whole problem. To, well, we say 
because it doesn't expressly provide, is it a lacuna or does it need to be purposely? Yes. Well, exactly. Yes. It's, it's not a question of there being a lacuna and what's it mean. It's, it, it, it's begging the question as to whether there is a gap or isn't. Yes, and, so, and, the, and we say that we there needs to be, a, in order, given the impact on third country nationals and the argument, uh, sorry, on third country nationals who become, who require EU citizenship, and given Ms. Mize, my learned friend Ms. Mize's contention that it's only forward looking and that you do have to effectively close your eyes to everything that happened before uh, in these circumstances, that we say that that would require some very particular justification. And we're not, critically, we're not saying we have acquired a right uh, before the sponsor acquires his citizenship. We're only saying that once he has acquired his citizenship, that is when, that's, that's a critical that. part of our case. I understand that, but can I, can I invite your submission in response to this question? Uh, it appears that what you're actually saying is that uh, past effects should be given to a present situation. In other words, the fact that he is now an EU citizen must be given effect so that it applies to the words of the directive, which talk about the time when the person was in the other state, dependent, and then moved here. So it, it seems well, to be the exact opposite. It's not present effect to what occurred before. You're trying to give past effect to what's occurred now. Yes. Well, we... Well, we we say that a present effect of the situation arising previously, the situation that arose previously was one of dependence, but it wasn't dependent on a person who was at that time mm. an EU national. Therefore, exactly. note it's not uh, defined in temporal terms. You're treating him as if he were an EU citizen at that time, um, so as to give them the rights and benefits as if he'd been an EU citizen all along which, of course, runs slap into the argument that Ms. Smythe made, which is, well, if that were the case, then even a direct family member um, could claim Social Security benefits at the time before they actually married an EU national. No, we... we, we, we the response to Ms. Smythe's point is that is entirely wrong and not consistent with our case. Our case is not that you acquire any rights to movement or residence card until the person is an EU national, the sponsor is an EU national. So there is not, uh, it's not right to say that we're seeking rights and benefits now. We're saying that once we have the nexus with the EU national, that the interpretation must take account of that historic situation of dependency and the dependency now. That is a purposive construction to the question of, de of pre-existing dependency. Dependency is very important, and then EU nationality acquisition. It's not on all fours with the um, Aladaselu situation, which I could, which is of would necessarily be of concern because they migrated without any status. They were either visa visitors or overstayers or illegal entrants, and then claimed the uh, the status that they did. But that was in circumstances where they had it. Miss, Miss Smythe will accept they had a connection with an EU national. We're in a a much in my submission, but it would apply, and I think you did accept uh, this morning that it would apply to an Aladazilo situation where there was dependency only both a, both before and after entry to the UK, but the person concerned did not become a UK citizen until after they'd entered the EU. But they wouldn't be able to rely on any. Any rights until yeah, the, but the once once uh, 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 the logical concomitant of your argument, and I know I appreciate the answer to it. You say is discretion, but the the concomitant of your argument is that if you had a a situation akin to Adelacilo, but you had the unbroken dependency that was not present in that case, um, but it's somebody who doesn't have treaty rights at the time when they enter the jurisdiction. So they enter the jurisdiction unlawfully with no right to be here, um, but they are dependent on somebody who is um, in Bangladesh as well, right? Yeah. And then uh, the person from Bangladesh moves over and gets nationality in an EU country. At that point, the point that, that person becomes an EU citizen, they can then get the rights because they simply because they've been dependent on him as a third country person who has no connection with the EU at all until he gets his citizenship. 
logically that must be right as a matter of, of, of uh, it flows from all your submissions. But that's, that, in, the, in a, the current case of a spouse, for example, in that situation, they're st they, they, they are treated in it the same way. If, if, Mr., if the sponsor here had had a, a spouse who was, lived, moved to the UK while, before he became an Italian national, once he became an Italian national, they could then rely on the uh, on the Adelaide Yes, principle. but but direct direct family members are different. We're dealing here with extended family members. But the, I, 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 I accept that, my lady. But <coughs> the point that I try I'm trying to make is that, given the concern about the how to interpret those family members, is largely about the the abuse or the policy point. That is my submission, which I don't think I should repeat anymore. But I think my submission is that the construction argument allows for the for the the, the the dependency in the way that we suggest without falling foul of a, of a public policy or interpretive um, uh, negative interpretive situation in because there is the, 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 the way in which the matter can be addressed through the use of the, the yeah. discretion and that's a, a, a perfectly workable and important way in which uh, this case can be construed and there's no principle of EU law that suggests that a qualifying family member should have to return to their country of origin in order to get a residence card. Um, so that uh, that is a really it, it's an, an important context. I hear what Miss my friend Miss Smythe says in relation to um, it's not necessarily the case that a person would be granted a residence card. But the point that the in Raman, which it just I think she took you to that to that paragraph, but it's important that. Any such requirements are consistent with the normal meaning of the words relating to the dependence and do not deprive the provision of its effectiveness. Paragraph forty. That's the the important uh, way in which it should be interpreted. So I might just just turn my back. <coughs> Just in response to to my my only friend's points in relation to the cases of uh, Romero and uh, Tisiostra, sorry, I can't pronounce that. Tisiostras, uh, they are not cases which my only friend just referred to at the end of her submissions. Those are not cases concerned with citizenship. We are specifically relying on Ziolkowski because it relates to citizenship, and there is no that that is the important distinction in in the way, way in which those cases are reasoned. And the contextual importance of them. Um, so, I think those. Unless I can assist you further, but bear with me. I'm so. Thank you. No. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miss Knight. Well, um, inevitably we'll take some time to to think about this and um, let you have our judgments in draft in due course um, for. Um, Tidying up with the re-argument, and if you'd be so good, please, as to agree an order that reflects our decision. If there are any points that you can't agree, um, we'll um, deal with those um, in writing uh, without the need to trouble you again for your attendance, and um, our formal judgments will be handed down in due course, probably electronically, but at all events without needing to ask you to um, attend again. Thank you all very much.